Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. So today I will talk about more on the clinical aspect and see on a more of a practical side. If I may, I might take, take on my mask. So basically what I'm going to talk about today is how we can use digital technology to improve the neurology clinical um, uh, service. So here it's the uh, building that our lab is located at, at Jula Longan uh, Hospital. You can visit us at Sato uh, on the 11th floor of, of this building. So basically our lab focuses on many things, but um, in, in broadly it will be from be measuring behavioral uh, side of thing and also correlate that with the, with the neuroscience signals such as fMRI and uh, EEG and also trying to apply uh, deep learning or machine learning for neurology application. As alluded to earlier that, you know, we are in the middle of the silver tsunami, so to speak. So basically the population is getting older. And as you can see here, that it's gonna get worse in the future as uh, Dr. Siobash has talked about. And one of the main focus is on Alzheimer's disease, of course, because as we're getting older, the brain's get, starting to get shrinked. And now we have this, this problem that, you know, it's incurable and how can we deal with this? Basically the way that we tackle this problem right now is to uh, detect this uh, condition before it's uh, at the point of no return. This condition is called mild cognitive impairment. Basically, this is just, you know, people would not just getting older and having bad memory, but there's something more than that. For example, this is the, one of my um, um, patients, he's 75 years old, came to, the, to my attention because of the progressive memory declines. But uh, when I examine her, I find that she has something that more beyond decline as she has some of the signs of frontal dysfunction, which is not typical. So I sent her for the scan. Oh, so before that, I did some best bedside uh, testing, which is what we call clock drawing task. This is very simple. You just tan uh, the patient's a, a paper and then a pen, and then ask her to draw a picture of, the, of a clock and say, please, tell, please draw a clock that tell times of 11, uh, 10 past 11. That's it, right? And this is her drawing. So as you can see here, that is not normal because the, the hand didn't go in the right direction, right? So it has a feeling that there's something wrong with her. So we send her for the scan and find that she has a big meningioma in the front of, 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 her, of her brain. So basically my point is that when you encounter the patients who have cognitive decline, it's not just that they might have Alzheimer's or not, but there's something beyond that. So we need to have a screening tools that allow us to detect the people who need the medical attention. And the way that we do it in clinic right now, now we call uh, Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Here is the example of the test and there's some other tests that you have to come to the clinic and do this certain task and it could take a while. This paper alone would take about 15 minutes at least if you ever done this and it could take as long as 45 minutes. If you add other tasks, then it could take hours. So here's the zoom in, the uh, task that we're gonna, we're gonna use in clinic. Here's there's 30 questions that you have to answer and then we count the number of you that you missed and see if you, you know, fall below the line that we call you uh, myocognitive impairment. The purpose of the talk today is going to tackle this specific question and see if we can improve the way that we screen for myocognitive impairment. And in addition, we have to, uh, you know, understand this condition a little bit more, right? So here is the, uh, the all the data that I'm going to talk about here came from this uh, healthy aging clinic in Jolalongon. We have seven thousand uh, healthy individuals who are older than sixty years old, no target image, and we plan to follow them up until the end of their life. So basically we have uh, patients who keep coming back to the clinic two times a year at least, okay? And this is the list of the thing that we're gonna measure, right? We measure the general health, the bone, muscle, vascular risk, fall, sleep, cognition, and so on and so on. We have right now 7,000 and counting. Here's the first um, uh, set of a study. I have to thank ahead of time the, this list of people would, you know, some of them, are, came here in, in, this, in this room today, who is the head of the, of the brain of the project, right? Especially uh, Dr. Itti and Dr. Itiparat uh, came in today. So basically we're asking exact same question. You saw earlier that we can use bedside uh, clock drawing tasks to screen for cognitive assessment. But 
you, you can see here that there's many type of deficit that you can see, right? And the way that we do right now in clinic is that you have to count the number of like a missing pieces. The easiest thing to do is to talk a circle enough or whether there's enough numbers, you know, whether the hand is pointing into the right direction. But there's more, there's a bunch of lists that you can use to measure how good the clock drawing is. So what if we can turn from pen and paper into digital assessment, right? You can turn the whole thing into digital assessment. Actually, you can turn the pen and paper drawing into a digital platform, and you can also uh, record the, the voice of the patients when they're performing this task, and then trying to use machine learning into, um, uh, to improve the diagnosis. And here's what we did earlier with Ajahn Saropat and Ajahn Bodban here at Jhulalongkorn, is to build the, the thing, the, the, the application that can measure both the drawing and the voice recording at the same time. So here, the classic way that we do my function impairment here is the uh, example of the healthy control and MCI and we see if we wanna use deep learning and to see if we can auto automate this process or not. So we use what we call um, convolution neural network here. It's the network, you can think about this model as seeing a picture and then they're trying to, to say whether this picture is, you know, what kind of animal is this, whether it's a dog or not, or with, the, you know, the, the, it might say dog with like certain percent probability, and then you give them another picture, and I will say this is cat by like 87% probability, so on and so forth. Then you can replace that with the picture the, the, the patients draw and see how, whether this is healthy or not, with how many, how much probability is this, right? So people have done this before. This is a lot of people who have done this in the past. But then because this is deep learning, that came with one problem here. So the deep learning won't tell you why, it will tell you that you, know, you might have a problem. This is basically the same thing that you, you might come to the fortune teller and say, tell me if we are gonna have MCI or Alzheimer's disease and I'm say, yes, with 80% probability. Then what's that gonna, you know, how, how are you gonna do with that? So basically we want to make sure that, you know, um, this is a, it's a significant improvement. And it's two important steps here. One is that we want to make sure that um, the machine will also tell you why it would say that you might have the MCI or in this case, right? And then also, we don't just do clock drawing, we do other type of drawing as well. Here we do cube copying and we do trail making as well. So why won't we throw in three of them instead of just one task? So cube copying task would be just to copy this drawing as accurate as possible. Here's the example. Trail making test is a bunch of numbers and letters. You have to switch between number and letters going from small to big. Uh, as, as you see here, this is MCI example of MCI patients with versus healthy control. So we uh, use the image on the left here and then use the pre-trained VGG uh, 16, which is a CNN model that has been trained before with ImageNet. Then you can add the uh, self-attention model that allow us to improve the classification accuracy and give the explanation. Then we stack them together and then see if they're gonna, you know, whether they can predict whether patients have MCI or not. But because we know that the cut point is not that um, strict, right? If you can have like 25 or 26 and 24, you might have a pretty much similar, um, you know, cognitive level, performance level. But then if you have 24, then we're going to call you an MCI. If you have 26, then you're, you're, you're past, which is weird. So we add a little bit of un uncertainty in the, in the task we call soft level. And the bottom line is that the model perform better with the soft level and also with the multi input that we give in a self attention layer. Here's an example of the model that not just give them give you the answer, but also trying to highlight the heat map of where the, the, uh, it thinks that went wrong, right? And then we can, can also uh, validate that with uh, expert. So we ask the expert to draw where the, the line shouldn't go and then compute the uh, intersection over union, which is whether the heat map of the model overlap with what experts say. And it seems to do a pretty good job at, at least comparing with the previous model. So in the future, we're gonna incorporate, like Dr. I Frank said that, you know, you don't just look at the image, but the way that they draw. So you can look at the step that they draw, the time it takes, so on and so forth, right? So you can use that and concatenate them and put them in the model to improve the future model and try to deploy it in the in hospital for real. 
In the second part of the talk, I want to talk about how we can actually also use the machine learning to understand the condition a little bit better. Go back to this um, task that I talked earlier. This has 30 questions here. If you have 24, then you, 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 you didn't pass and you uh, get level with MCI. But imagine that you have you encounter two patients who miss six scores out of 30, and one would be the patients who cannot remember all of the list in the, in the, in the bottom here versus the patients who cannot name all of this image. Would you say that these two patients are the same? On the surface, they, all, they both have 24 out of 30, but you would think that they might have different types of pathology in the brain. And this is because we know in the past that different parts of the brain do different things. So you won't, you won't expect them to have, all to have the same disease. So of course, in the, in the clinic, we have a um, type of classification before, right? We, we classify people according to like, whether they have memory problem or not, whether they have a problem in only one domain versus multiple domain, but this is not in any way data-driven approach. So we wanted to try to see, you know, if we can leverage the number of subjects or patients that we, ha we, are, we have in clinics and see if we can uh, test a bunch of subjects and see if how, how many actual patterns of uh, cognitive deficit in this group of people in between the borderline, which is 23 to 27. Basically, people will have around the cognitive impairment range. Because if you cluster them straight off, you, you, will, you will see that, you know, people will have high score and low score, and we don't want that. We want to make sure that they have pretty much equal number of score, but we want to see the different pattern in, in the way that they have cognitive deficit. So um, the way that we do is that we normalize a score to make sure that you know, we have seven domains, which is visual spatial domain, attention, memory, orientation, and so on. We normalize them to make sure that they're equal because right now we don't have number, uh, equal number of uh, score in, in, in each domain. And we do the clustering technique. We wanna make sure that we get a reasonable result. So we split the data into two half and then cluster them independently and then compare these two half to make sure that we get pretty much similar uh, result in both group. So you're gonna see something like this. You're gonna plot all the, the memory tests instead of looking at the whole score, you can look at the, how they perform in each, in each test. For example, attention, naming, orientation, memory. This is an example of one of the pattern that we saw. Here you see that they have pretty good visual spatial and abstraction attention naming and orientation, but pretty bad in language and memory in a memory task. So you can compare with the other group, which is, you know, you see that even though they have similar uh, number of uh, score, they have different pattern here. And you look at the other half and you see uh, pretty similar pattern here. You overlap these two and you see that even though you split the data and group them in a similar pattern here. You keep doing this and you see that, you know, you see the blue line here is one group and the red line is another group. And you see pretty consistent pattern here that even though you split the data into two half, you see consistent grouping result here. That in the, in the first time that we see that we can be able to quantify how many types of MCI that we have instead of just say whether they have MCI or not. And this is important, particularly important because we believe that by classifying MCI better, you'll be able to predict the future more, right? If they, uh, one patient will have MCI, might not always turn to Alzheimer's disease in the future. They may have tumor, they might be normal individuals who just like, you know, tend to forget things. But by doing clustering technique and do discovery of the hidden pattern, this is gonna be uh, useful in the future that you'll be able to say, this group of people need to be followed up more frequently, or this group of people will be fine, or this group of people will need, need imaging immediately, right? And because these people are, you know, following up in our clinic for, you know, we, we plan to follow up them forever, you can also look at the future ahead, like whether, you know, clustering today would predict the future many years down the road. And this is just, few examples of the thing that, you know, you open up the door and you say, this is a digital assessment of the cognition, but there's something else that you can do as well. For example, in the clinic, we do something that very simple, like a finger tapping task. So you ask the patient to tap the finger as fast as possible. And you use this to as a sign of Parkinson's disease or stroke. So in, you know, in, 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 in a clinic right now, you have to rely on new, neurologists like me. You have to come to me and say, 
doctor, can you, can you look at this patient and see if they have Huntington's disease or not? But you don't need to do that because the fact that the specialist can see some pattern that's hidden in that finger tapping mean that there's something in that finger tapping that you can discover and maybe a little more. So here's an example of, I just, you know, use the, the movie that I just took from my iPhone and then just throw in one model and see, you know, the gamer today, they want to, you know, instead of using the mouse, they want to use a hand to control the, the cursor. So I just throw in one of the two walk and it, it worked right away. And you can see here that, you know, this patient have Parkinson's disease and we have what we call bradykinesia, which is the, the amplitude of the tapping will get smaller across, uh, over time. And you see that pattern right away without having to consult specialists whether this patient have Parkinson's disease or not. So here's an example of the thing that we do it properly in a, in a, in a laboratory setting. We you know, put the red and the, and the blue thing here on the glove to make sure that we can also uh, confirm the position of the finger, this two finger with, with color or images as well. We also be able to apply this into other domains. So instead of just you know, finger tapping, you can also listen to the voice. The patients will come to you with dysatria or, you know, they, they, the, the speech might be intellectual. You know, you say you'll be able to tell, okay, this patient will have dysatria, but in the future, you know, think about like, you know, medical and like you follow up with your doctor every three to six months. And then they will ask like, do you feel better or worse? Because they could not remember how you did last time. But if you'll be able to quantify this, how bad your voice is in terms of number, instead of just like, you know, whether have, you have it or not. So how are we going to do it? We can, we can record the voice like this. This is This is the, the sentence, right? This is a sentence that you record from control. This is the, 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 the spectral density of the dysartic patient, patients here. You can see with your eyes, they're kind of different. You can throw in some fancy model, but we think that one way that we, you know, we can do right now is to open up your phone, open up the line apps, and then, you, know, you just punch in this, uh, you know, the recording and then ask them to type out what you say. And here is an example of the normal control here. They say, It's pretty accurate here. Okay, the you know, line, the speech you take is not couldn't capture chow rai versus chow lai, which is fine. I mean, in Thai, we say chow lai all the time. But this atria here is they like completely mess up. So here we just, you know, easy, you just turn some simple thing, like just, you know, instead of relying on, on specialists, you can do something creative here. You can use the, your digital technology and you can turn this from like, you know, analog world into digital world and maybe we have better assessment in the future. This is a bit almost like a board sword or something, right? Um, okay, so in the future, if we have better assessment, it will lead us to a better community and better medical service. And hopefully we will be able to enjoy healthy and um, aging society in the future. I would like to thank you all of my um, people here in the lab um, and all of the collaborator. And thank you, you all for, for, for your attention. And thank you, RISC, for inviting me today. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaitashin Harad, for your uh, interesting data from the real patient and uh, really insightful um, data. So now is a Q&A session. Do you have any question? Yes, please. It's an amazing talk. Um, quick, maybe quick two questions. Um, for the first experiment that you show where you have the drawing of, of the clock mm. as your um, features in the models. Mm. In the end of the day, you still have to train the model based on diagnosis given by the doctors. Right. Which means you don't really have a ground truth whether or not right. MCI is is, MCI correctly... is, the, uh, is a soft ground. Right? right. So it's very difficult to diagnose MCI right now. Right. Right now, we do depends on the, the outcome of the test, which is, you know, people will fall below a certain cut point. It's not appropriate for their age. And we take that as MCI. Right. But in the future, of course, the better uh, diagnosis would be to follow them up for many years and say, in five years from now, whether you're going to have dementia or not, that will be the hard outcome. But as of now, we uh, accept the... Um, uncertainty of you know, that diagnosis, but this is the best that we can do right now. But of course, maybe what you're trying to, to ask is that 
how do we know whether they have dementia for real? Yeah. So because they are in this clinic, we can follow them up and they're still following up right. with us. So maybe we can look at the future, whether, you know, this clock dying would be, we have a better level in the future. Yeah. So my, actually my, my question is relating to your, your second experiment right. where now you pass the data, you didn't mm -hmm. came in and what have you, to get a new target. Can you right. use a new, that target as from your second experiment? the target for your first right experiment. right that you you Meaning, mean like using the clustering, cl yeah, um, clustering definitions as the level at the level and mm -hmm. then do the do, do the um supervised learning. supervised learning on that unsupervised level yeah <laughs> interesting um one of the uh challenge right now would be the number of the um level that we have because in a clustering we tend to limit them to a certain range Right. So we have around like 600, maybe that's enough, but that's a good idea. Maybe we can try that. Okay. Right, thanks. The online. So, okay. Thank you so much for your you. <laughs> impressive presentation. Thank you.